This is Create the Next from Pro CFO Partners, where every week we explore strategies and ideas for financial management and growth to help today's businesses put their financial picture in context. Welcome back to Create the Next. I'm Chris Bentliff. Ryan Walter is back with us, Managing Director of Pro CFO Partners. Ryan, we had such an interesting conversation uh, last time that I couldn't wait to get you back uh, kind of behind the mic and behind the camera, because I, I want to talk a little bit about systems and processes, which uh, that's maybe a little bit of a stale kind of a vanilla phrase, but it's one of the kind of core tenets of of how Pro CFO Partners, uh, the, the perspective it takes in helping organizations kind of figure themselves out, but also it's kind of the backbone of the whole show for any of us. And, and it's really easy to focus on sales and marketing and product design or manufacturing uh, efficiency and all this stuff. And all of that is connected to, related to, integrated with, dependent on systems and processes. So let's talk about it. Do you have kind of a starting place? Like when you're talking with your clients or with others and you're sort of diagnosing it, maybe there's an issue here. What is it that sets you off or what's kind of your starting place to sort of let's, let's, let's have a common vocabulary about what we're talking about here. Well, first, thanks for having me back. I'm glad I didn't scare everyone off, and it's awesome to be uh, joining you again today. And you're right. I think systems and process, when you hear that, probably causes 90% of people their, for their yawn reflex to kick in. Uh, I understand that. Um, and I, I think it's part of the problem there is just how people look at that and what they think it is. To, to me, this is all about how we work mm. um, and how we work better. And it's important because... Um, if I ask you, how do you make a cake or how do you bake? You have a system or a process for doing that. You have to get the stuff. You have to follow a recipe. Everything we do is there. Now, maybe it's not the sexiest thing, but getting down to how we work um, in many ways to me hits at the heart of probably the most important thing we have to manage, both for ourselves and across the organization. And Pink Floyd had it right. It's all about time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't want it to fritter away. And it's the limited thing we're able to spend. It has the most impact almost in all cases on the value for what we can drive. And that's when I'm talking with people. It's about how do we use your time, everyone's time, the right way to get the greatest value out of it. Uh, and that, to me, when you can unlock time and value and you talk about what it can mean, that's when it starts to really ring true with others and how we do things, because it also unlocks how we get information and how we make decisions and how we invest. All of that, the heart of it starts with understanding our systems and processes and the right way to approach them. I mean, there's so much there that uh, I respond to and that, that resonates with me. And one of those is uh, I think in a lot of organizations, at least some that I've worked in, when we think about systems and processes, immediately our minds go to the how, and we're thinking about the new ERP or the new CRM or the software we need for this or the way we can streamline that or the automations for this and all that is cool. But part of what I'm hearing you say is uh, there's something to do ahead of that, which is to sort of understand maybe where the inefficiencies, if there are some, exist, what they are. And, and I love this idea of time kind of being the currency in other words, we we kind of need to develop a, a common focus before we can understand how we're going to approach that. Is that accurate? Yeah, to me, it all starts with what we do first. Um, you know, systems, the technologies and everything are great and, and they come. But I think if you're putting the technology first, you're kind of reversing it. And this is a bit of the cart before the horse situation. Um, I think it's important to start simple. And it's about understanding the core things we do. How do we do them? Now, why is that important? Uh, one, quality. How do we do things consistently? How do we make sure that we're getting the right information, the right results? And, and that is key. I think when we're then looking at where do we want to go, why do we want to do it, it's better to start with, well, what does this end result look like versus, oh, there's this great whizzy piece of technology out there. And I'm going to tell you all, technology is great. And technology salespeople are wonderful people, but they're really good at promising lots of great things you could be doing. And I'm going to tell you 99% of the time, you'll never end up doing it because you're doing what you do and you're doing what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And so my recommendation is always starting with when you are thinking about that, what is it you want? If I were to come back to you in a year and say, how is this working? What does good look like? Start there. And if you can start there and work backwards, 
then if you believe technology is the answer, it makes your conversation so much more robust with them to say, well, look, here's what we want to be. Here's what we want to become. Show us how this will do that. Not give me the marketing brochure and talk about all the wonderful things it can do. Show me how you solve my problem. And I think when it gets to that technology component that you talked about, that's really important because then you can also make smart decisions say, is this a wise investment for this? Does this help us reclaim? Maybe it does minimize issues. Maybe you're not getting the information you need to make the right decisions and it will support that. But then you can make very informed decisions going forward as to whether this is worth the investment and what kind of then time does that help you recover? Do you get the time back of staff so they can focus on higher value tasks? And that's terrific if it can be done. But I think there's a lot of horror stories out there about technology to put in and you end up limiting yourself because the technology itself, maybe the way it's put in, uh, prevents certain things from happening. And then you're inventing, you're investing time from people into it that should be spent elsewhere because they're doing this and they're moving an Excel spreadsheet over here. And as a result, it becomes an anchor on what you're looking to do. Who who should be involved in this? Like, is this an organization wide is this a let's set a committee up? Because there's so many points of friction uh, where a systematized process, something predictable, uh, mm-hmm. should and can help out. But there's so many variables depending on the size of the organization. Obviously, no one size fits all. But what's kind of your general guidance for here's who you should maybe make sure is in that conversation? And I, I think it depends on what you're talking about, right? Because there's obviously large, robust processes. There's very small uh, perhaps tactical ones, and each of those will differ. I am a firm believer, though, and it's not to have a committee for a committee, but one of the biggest challenges we often have is we don't understand how we impact each other. Mm-hmm. We don't understand how what we do impacts other groups, and this impacts the performance of the company. So I do think it's critical to get those impacted by this. And how do you start understanding that? I often suggest, well, just simply draw out the process. Who are the people that feed into it? at one point or the other? Who are the people who are impacted by the results of that process, right? So if you're, uh, if I'm, I'm a baker, and I'm um, making a cake, um, have I talked to the waiter or waitress staff about, well, how heavy is this? How many pieces of cake can you take out? Are we going to be able to serve this to our customers? And that's just an overly kind of simplified suggestion. But I think it's important to get in because I, I think one of the more interesting challenges you always see with software is, well, when I put it in, this broke something downstream that nobody knew about. And all of a sudden now, so-and-so can't do their work. That's why I think it's important to get in to understand. Does that mean you run it via committee? No, not necessarily. Maybe they're stakeholders and it's an opportunity to engage them in what you're looking to do to make sure everyone is able to adjust effectively. Um, And I think informing them, understanding how it impacts their work is critical. But I also suggest, and this tends to be a problem, and it's a little more legacy approach where people would do these big bang initiatives where let's just rip everything out and put this gigantic new thing in. Start simple. Start with basic processes. Start with a smaller subset of items. They'll typically impact less people. And then gradually grow on top of that. Because what you find is as you get greater and greater, the level of complexity gets harder. The chance that everything goes pear-shaped is huge. If you begin by growing on certain items, what you find is often other problems go away. You might have another challenge you need to deal with as a result, but there's often certain things perhaps were impacted that you didn't even know about. So now as a result, because you kind of carved out this small bit, you're able to adjust, see what the result was like there, and then make the next change. You feel like there are some commonalities or... um... How do I, as I'm listening and I'm kind of a, a leader, I'm an executive, I'm a thought leader in my organization, I'm a, I'm, a man, I'm a manager, how do I know, are there symptoms you can indicate, uh, my systems are broken mm-hmm. versus I really need to create some systems versus this is pretty good, but I'm hearing some things that make me think I need to iterate or get some collaboration. What are some symptoms that I could be experiencing that helps me know without having to like spend a month figuring it out that, hey, this is a place to start. As you say, start simple. How do I kind of start to calibrate that internally? Yeah, I think there's a couple things you can do often when it comes to that. You know, one is I would ask a couple people who are involved with that. Um, Very simply, how does, you know, how is this working? What's going wrong? 
because the folks who live this every day often can can get in there and they may talk about something. Um, are you seeing disparate responses, right? So are you dealing with something that um, you're getting inconsistency or you don't always get the same answer? It's another way to kind of let you hone in on where something may be. Is it really human intensive? Is there a, Are there a lot of steps and a lot of people involved and a lot of key places where something could go wrong? All of those can kind of give you a sense of where you may be dealing with a challenge, right? Because what they indicate might be, oh no, we, we we just have this convoluted thing. Too many hands are in the kitchen and we can't have that anymore because it's just humans can't be involved at that level. Um, and without some automation, we are not going to be able to improve it. Or maybe you're just somewhere there's code wrong. And what you're finding is, oh, we're getting different results every day because somewhere there's some variable that's off. And solving those two problems are completely different. Mm-hmm. Now, what they the problem may manifest itself the same way, but by spending just a little time, you don't have to get the whole committee together, spending a month analyzing all the data, you can pretty quickly get there because what you find is the folks who live this every day kind of know what's going wrong. We just have to take the time as leaders to talk with them and engage and say, look, here's the pr- challenge or problem we see. We'd like to involve you in helping us figure out what it is and open up the door and see what they say. You'd be surprised they may actually know what's going on and you never thought of asking. This is a fascinating sort of um, phenomenon. It's come up, uh, 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 you know, again and again. One of the analogies that I like is um, you sell printers. Well, you know, the administrative assistant might not be the person who buys the printer and they're going to be, be the people who tell you we need to buy a printer. They're the ones using it all day long. And so if, if we're kind of insulated to, you know, the C-suite or the executive team or the, the 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 dollar spenders, the decision makers, we might be missing out on kind of what's really happening kind of on the ground. And and that, I think, is really key, right, to just sort of make this a, a, a almost a, a, a holistic exercise in the organization, almost a culture of feedback and listening that maybe some of us don't necessarily naturally practice we need to kind of figure that out well i think you're right look it's not a natural thing i think often as as leaders maybe we see ourselves as i have to make the decisions and and i understand that um you know sometimes there's not a lot of time um and we look at things as tasks or activities so that is is reaching out to someone to ask questions a task is an activity is that tactical how do i get my results but to me it's kind of like anything we do um if I'm going on, if I'm if I'm a travel agent, um, and I'm setting up your family's vacation, it's not the vacation I want to take. <laughs> it doesn't matter where I want to go. It's where you want to go, and what's going to be what will bring enjoyment or interest to you. And if I'm not spending that time, um, that's there. And I think this gets to a topic I'm sure you've talked about in other sessions that often comes up is silos. And often we're building these silos without knowing we're doing it. We're not trying to put silos up, but by saying, oh, we think we know the answer. We know what's going on. Oh, I had that role 10 years ago. I know what it takes to do that. Well, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but you may not know how things are going now. And I think, you know, often, yes, it can be daunting because, oh, how many conversations do we have? I have a thousand people in the team and you can manage it the right way to get that engagement. But it's also how do you build that mechanism? So working downstream other managers do this. So you can begin getting this um, flow of information back to help you make that. And I think it's also creating a culture where it's okay to feedback, right? You don't get your head chopped off because you said, hey, look, this isn't working. This isn't you complaining about your job or you know whining about a challenge. You're saying, look, I, I want to do a good job here, but this is taking me three times as long as it should. And I know You're trying to make decisions for the organization. You're basing it on certain assumptions. Those assumptions can't work because what we have here not only does it not work as well as you think it does, if you're trying to grow, you're going to be multiplying this problem by 10 because you're going to be trying to do an inefficient process over and over and over again, and you're just going to create greater chaos for us. What great advice that is. And and I feel like uh, it it leads a little bit into my, my, my next thought, which is so so let's say that I put in the time and the energy and the the resources. I've done it all, you know, right, and I've got what I feel like are pretty solid systems and processes. How often do I revisit that? Do I just wait for the next emergency to point out a flaw? Do I every quarter sort of revisit this? Do I just assume it's a flywheel and it'll run until something throws into the flywheel and now we got to examine it? Is it a science? Is it an art? What do you think? Uh, it's probably it's a bit of the yin and the yang at times. 
I think there's a point where I don't know if there's a, a quarter, a month, a year, but I think you have to embed in your thought process. This isn't a set it and forget it. Yeah. Right. So I should have a proactive process where I do outreach, but it, it and ask, but also if you can embed that within the culture of, hey, when things are going wrong or when there's challenges, let us know. It comes up, it bubbles its way up to you and you hear about it. It's not something you quash down or you know, you're bringing a challenge up to. One of the other things I think is also important is if you know you're planning something, there's changes coming, that's a great opportunity to say, hey, we're thinking about doing this. One, it's a great way to involve the company and where you're trying to go and get everybody into the solution. What don't we know? Right. I know an organization actually they they do a lot and uh, they publish a lot of content online. Um, and they had this great idea about new things they were going to do. Um, they go out and they go find another organization that they're going to collaborate with. And the people who made the deal didn't realize that they're on almost antiquated <laughs> content management systems. There's mainframes behind them. I know, heaven forbid, 1980s mainframes are still working. Um, and this, but the folks who agreed this deal were like, oh, we're going to build these integrations and we're going to do all this. And they said, by the time it got to them, they're like, no, none of that can work unless you're going to spend $10 million investing in upgrading our systems. So a whole lot of time, because a couple people got together with a great idea, um, got wasted, and then they had to reimagine how they were going to do this because nobody said, oh, great idea. Is this even feasible? Is it feasible in the way we want to do it? So I think those are great triggers, which is what's coming that may create change? What's coming that's a delta from how we do things? And before we just kind of blindly head down that path, let's ask people, like, are we going to get into anything? Does this cause us a bit of a challenge before we do that? Um, and that can be a really good trigger, I think. Ryan Walter is just full of genius insights. Uh, thank you for all of this guidance on systems and processes. And like our last conversation, I feel like we could probably talk for another two hours. So I'm going to get you back here so we can start to peel some of this apart uh, in depth because it's fascinating stuff. It's essential stuff. And it's also the kind of stuff, as you said, with set it and forget it. We can put a ton of energy behind this. We can say this is the year of systems and processes. And then we think, OK, done. And, you know, five years go by before we even dust this thing off again. And then we're dealing with mainframes and war games. And it's it's miserable. Mm -hmm. Thanks for everything today. I really appreciate it. Well, hopefully no one's running into the Whopper. Um, I'm sure Matthew Broderick won't be uh, reappearing on us, but it's been an absolute pre pleasure joining you today. Thank you, please, for uh, getting my 80s movies references. That's, that's, oh. <laughs> that's the highlight of my day. <laughs> Take care, man. Have a good one. Thanks for watching, and a special thanks to our subscribers. Consider becoming one today. Visit ProCFOPartners.com for more strategies and ideas for financial management and growth to help you put your business's financial picture in context.